Hi, I'm Pete McCall. Welcome to episode 99 of All About Fitness. On this episode of All About Fitness, it's an honor to have as a guest, Ms. Shauna Harrison, who has a PhD in public health. Now, most people might know Shauna from her frequent posts on Instagram. She has been recognized as one of the most influential trainers on the Instagram platform. But when I looked at her background and looked at her bio and saw that she had a master's, or not even a master's, but a PhD in public health, I wanted to have a conversation with her about how we can move the dial on getting people more involved in fitness. And what really intrigued me was, given her education, given her background, was how she's using Instagram to engage people. Because you can say a lot of things about social media. You can say a lot of things about social media and fitness. But one thing that, that I've noticed, and one thing I think we can all agree upon, is that social media can have a positive influence on fitness. I don't know about you, but when I see some of my friends and colleagues post things on their social media pages, it encourages me to work a little bit harder. Or if I see somebody doing something and thinking, if he or she can do that, I can do that as well. And that's exactly what Shauna and I talk about today. We talk about the positive influence that social medias have on getting people more active. And after the interview, I'll share a few ideas on how we can use, kind of how we can change the model of public health to try to help people make time for more activity, try to help people move more in their day. Because we have this big public health, we have this big public health crisis. We have a healthcare crisis. But doing little things, being more active, making some smart nutrition choices, drinking more water, getting more sleep, those sound like little things, but they can have a positive impact on you, your life, and your overall quality of health. After a brief word from the sponsor of All About Fitness, it's an honor to have a conversation with Shauna Harrison, PhD. What is part bench, part balance trainer, part stability ball, part jump box, and all results? The TerraCore by Vicor Fitness, specially designed to help enhance balance, strength, agility, and metabolic conditioning. The TerraCore is quickly becoming the go-to piece of workout equipment used by fitness professionals around the world. Whether you're training to earn that eight-figure contract or just trying to get in better shape, the TerraCore will help you achieve results you never thought possible. TerraCore by Vicor Fitness, the shape of things to come. Go to www.vicorefitness.com and use code AAF that's all about fitness, AAF, to save 20% on the purchase of a TerraCore. I'm Peter McCall, all about fitness here today with Shauna Harrison. Shauna, can you give us a little background about what you do in fitness and what you're known for? <laughs> this is always my favorite question slash my least favorite question. <laughs> I am an instructor first. I've been teaching for 22 years, um, all different realms of classes. I started with step back in the day um, and have sort of moved all the way through. I teach mostly sort of yoga and boot camp style classes at this point. Um, I also have a background in public health. Um, I do a lot of social media stuff. I work with a lot of brands on both developing content as well as sort of, you know, being in a lot of content um, and helping them with their, their promo stuff. Yeah, a little bit of everything. <laughs> so how did you get started teaching group fitness? And it's funny you say that in, you know, full disclosure, my wife uh, was a step instructor for, for a long time and, and I used to take her step classes, which was always a hoot, but, uh, how'd you get started in step? Yeah. Um, so this is also one of the interesting things. I always say that I've said this many times that I got into the industry for all the wrong reasons. And I feel like I stayed for all the right reasons. Um, I played sports, you know, sort of from fourth grade on the only thing I ever liked to do was play basketball. That was literally it. I hated running. I hated, I couldn't do anything. I, you know, wrote extra credit reports to get an A and PE (laughs) and junior high. And, you know, like I, I just wasn't super active other than I liked playing basketball and that was it. And then I got to high school and I, um, you know, had started getting into cheerleading as in junior high through Pop Warner and then kind of continued to do that a little bit into high school, then got on the cheerleading team and in high school was on the basketball team and started, you know, sort of doing all of the things. Um, and I, you know, got very wrapped up in the aesthetic sort of 
part of fitness and movement and sports and, you know, also just being very perfectionistic and type A, I, you know, started developing an eating disorder essentially, but I got into fitness trying to attain this perfect body, um, that never was attained because it's unattainable. (laughs) Um, and you know, I was doing sort of fitness classes either in the off season or sometimes also during the season. Um, and step was one of the things that I like really loved because I loved music and I, I liked movement and, you know, from there, eventually, you know, I, again, stayed in fitness because of the love of movement and the challenge and all of that. But, um, I initially started teaching because I was taking this class on a weekly basis and the instructor was like, Oh, do you want to learn how to teach? And I was like, sure. And so like after class, like once a week, he would stay with me and there was one other girl that was doing it too. And um, he would teach us, you know, just little, little bits and pieces, like how to, you know, how to choreograph, how to be on the beat, how to teach and, and talk at the right moment while you're still doing it and, you know, showing something else and, you know, all of these different things and thinking of the step ahead. And, you know, I feel like it's things that people don't do anymore, right? Like now there's these certifications and these workshops and these things that happen like over a weekend or a day. And there's not this, like, it was like a mentorship for like, I don't even know how long. I well, want to say it's funny. It's funny you say that, and, and I'm going to ask where you did it in just a second because my wife, you know, been a longtime step instructor, and it's so funny. She has her undergraduate degree in chemistry, and we met when she was in her master's program in in DC. And her mother tells me that she was happier to get, she was more excited to get her group fitness certification than her degree in chemistry when she did that a number of years ago. But what she had to do, Shauna, was as a step instructor, she would have to take the top students in class like yourself and teach them how to teach class if she ever wanted to take a day off because there really wasn't a lot of step instructors. So what your instructor did was what my wife would do with like, she did with like four or five people that would say, you're a great step student. Let me teach you how to teach. And then my wife would just plug them in and put them in as subs when she wanted to take a day off or go out of town or something. So where'd you learn, learn to teach? I mean, I just want to give that as a little kind of like a dirty little secret. So it was like, she's really good. Maybe she can fill in for me when I want the day off. I think it's what your instructor was thinking. Where'd you first learn to teach? This was at the YMCA. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, it was, it was also just, you know, I was, believe it or not, I was like very shy up until I was in high school. And so this was, I was kind of at the moment of getting out of my shyness a little bit, but he, you know, he would have us teach like a little bit of his warm up and then teach a little bit of his cool down and exactly what you're saying, just kind of like prep us to be able to teach if we ever wanted to teach a whole class. And it was just like, I didn't think much of it at the time, but like, that is literally how I learned to develop everything that I've ever taught. You know, it's, it's this process that, um, I now put myself through if I'm teaching something different, but that was my senior year in high school. And so by the time I got to college, um, I was already teaching. Where'd um, you grow up? Did you grow up in California? Cause you went to UCLA for undergrad, right? No, I went to Stanford for undergrad. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so um, we're in California. In you go in where? In the Bay Area. Oh, cool. And that's where you still live, right? I live in Oakland now, but yeah. Okay. Bay Area still. And and so going back to teaching, how do you feel that learning how to teach? How has that helped you in terms of being able to do like public speaking? Because that's one thing I always suggest to people that want to get into fitness education. It's like, well, do you teach group exercise? Because if you ever want to be a public speaker, I think being yeah. a group exercise instructor is, is, you know, you talk about the 10,000 hours of repetitions. That's the perfect 10,000 hours. How do you feel your experience as a group fitness instructor has helped you in terms of other things you've done? Oh my God. Tremendously. You know, again, like all through high school, I remember taking, you know, speech classes and whatever we were supposed to take. And I have one of my best friends, you know, he, he still to this, he was in that class with me and he still to this day is like, I remember you trying to give speeches and like you, you, you are a totally different person now. And I think, you know, fitness itself, especially things like step where it's like, you know, I was always taught you're thinking three moves ahead. You're doing, you're saying two moves ahead and you're doing the move that you're, that's actually happening. Right. And so it's like, there's so much of this forward thinking slash being in the moment, but also like recognizing what's going on. And, you know, I now feel much more comfortable actually speaking to larger groups than, you know, just one on, not, not completely, but like, you know, I'm very comfortable like being in front of people. Granted when I, when I 
ever, if I'm speaking or guest lecturing or anything like that, my natural go-to is like, I want to make you move. I don't want you to just sit there. Like, I'm like, can we do some burpees in the middle <laughs> of this talk right now? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think just being able to, I think it's a very different way of being in front of people too, right? Like if you're just speaking, you're just looking at an audience that's just staring at you. But if you're trying to teach someone movement, like there's this, even if it's an unspoken, there's this interaction that's happening. You know, you're telling them something, they're doing it in their body. You can see if what you're saying is resonating with them immediately, right? Because if you're saying it in a way that doesn't, they don't quite understand or they can't feel in their body, you'll be able to tell. Um, and I think that that's like, it's such a learning experience in terms of communication and and being very precise with your words and, you know, trying to say something that's going to make sense to the majority of people, but then, you know, also having to say things more specifically to, to accommodate whatever else might be going on in the class. And I want to stay on this for one second, because what I tell instructors, Shauna, when I do like a workshop or something, is that if you, if you give a cue and there's one person in the group that does it wrong, well, they just might have, they might not have understood the cue, but if you do, if you give a cue and five or six people do it wrong, then it's a coaching error. And the cue yeah, you I'm gave, sure. you know, you know, cause then it's like, okay, that's on me. You guys didn't understand. Obviously more than one person didn't understand it. That's that, that's my fault as an instructor. How has that really helped you think about in terms of your communication style? I mean, Oh, I mean, I, I think it plays more than just speaking, right? I mean, I think in 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 writing, in in anything that you do, you know, there's going to be things that make sense to you in your head, but then when you try to communicate it to either verbally or written or however it might be, like people aren't going to necessarily understand what's going on in your brain. So, it's, <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm always trying to communicate in a way that the majority of people will understand. Um, and I think that that goes, you know, and, and I'm sure doing what you do, you know, when we're, when we're talking about sort of high level thinking and, you know, the, the different vocabularies that go into all of the different things that we do, they're not necessarily, not everybody can understand all of those vocabularies. So it's, a, it's a matter of, you may understand something in a language that, that speaks to whatever, you know, very small portion of people that understand that. And if you're trying to communicate to that, that to people that aren't in that world, you have to figure out how do I translate that into a way that like makes sense to other people. And, you know, I think that that's in, in relationships in friendships in, you know, in any kind of articles that you write and, you know, in anything, like, I think that it's super valuable to learn how, I mean, it's just learning how to communicate and how to like really pay attention also, it's not just, you're not just talking at someone, but there's like this interaction. Well, and, and to give, to be in the interest of full transparency here, and I think we communicate about this a little bit via email, but one of the reasons I reached out to you is what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give voice to some of the people that are on Instagram because it is hard to have that communication. I think you've been recognized as one of the top Instagram fitness people on Instagram and because of what you do in terms of yoga and in terms of movement. And so what I want to do with the podcast is to give you a little bit of voice so that people that follow you on Instagram can learn a little bit more about you as an individual, as an instructor, and especially with your unique education background. So that's why I wanted to reach out to you to have you well, on. You. <laughs> and, and well, how did you, how did you get interested in studying public health? Because I want That's what I think is is so fascinating. And, and like I said in the first email I wrote, but how did you get? In, what is number one? Let's ask, I'm gonna ask a question. What is public health? And how did you get started down that road? Public health is actually a very broad category of you know it, it varies from anything from very specific you know biostatistics all the way through environmental health to mental health to health behavior, um, policy work. It's, it's a very broad department in most of the schools that it, it, it sits in. Um, and I, you know, I think ever since I actually got into fitness, I've been really interested in health and, you know, obviously movement was a big piece of that. But <laughs> when I got to Stanford, um, and anyone who ever went to Stanford probably already knows what I'm gonna, where I'm going with this. There's this, there's a major called human biology that's, that's known as being the weed out class for, for um, med students, right? Mm -hmm. Or people who want to go into med school um, because it's a requirement for anybody who's in the human biology major. And a human biology major is often someone who wants to go into the health field. 
uh, I got weeded <laughs> very quickly. I got weeded. Uh, and you know, part of it was the, 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 I'm not a good test taker. It was very, you know, it was very human biology. Um, and I like felt at that moment cause I was like, Oh, I really want to go into health, but I didn't want to necessarily go to med school. Um, and I was like, uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, I don't really want to change my major because I want to go into health, but like at the same time, like, I don't want to, you know, fail out of Stanford. <laughs> so I, you know, I was double majoring in Spanish. And so I ended up getting rid of those. I was like, I'm not going to do human biology, at least not right now. And my thing was, and I remember saying this, if I want to go back to health, I'll come back to it at some point. That's what I said. And so instead I, you know, I kind of went more into my Spanish <clears throat> double major that I was planning on doing and then ended up adding on Latin American studies. Um, you know, I'm half Mexican, so Latin America and, and all of that goes with that, the, the culture, the history and all of that has always been super interesting to me. But one of the things I really liked about the Latin American studies major is that I could kind of focus on one particular thing if I wanted to, um, and writing an honors thesis was part of that major. Um, and so I got to pick what I wanted to do. And since I had known that I, you know, was coming off of dealing with some eating disorder issues uh, and body image was a really big, you know, sort of topic that was interesting to me. I ended up writing about body image in a Latin American country and, you know, sort of took help and put it in the framework that I was able to really be in with my major. Um, and then when I went back to school, I applied for a master's in Latin American studies, again, thinking, you know, now, now I, my interest in health had sort of been looking into the developing world of Latin America and health issues that come up there, um, as well as sort of the Latino population. So my, I applied for a master's in Latin American studies at UCLA, knowing that they had a dual program with public health. And so I was like, well, you know, I'll, maybe I'll apply for this and then see if I can get into that. And that's what I did. <laughs> so I applied for Latin American studies and then applied after my second year of taking some public health classes for my Latin American studies major, um, then added on public health. So I ended up with two masters from UCLA, um, and then went directly from there into the PhD because I had just basically started scratching the surface of what public health really is. Um, and wanted to do more and wanted to learn more. And so then I applied for the PhD and ended up at Hopkins, um, to do that. And so that's kind of, it was a roundabout way, but I essentially did exactly what I said, which is if I wanted to go back to health, I would. And I did. <laughs> well, I, to one thing on that, Shauna, that I think is very interesting is, and I've spent a lot of time in Asia the last you know, in the last few years doing fitness workshops over there. And that's as we've exported, you know, our first American jobs, as the economy has grown and we've sent certain manufacturing jobs overseas, some have gone to Latin America, you know, NAFTA certainly had a big deal with that. And, you know, we've seen this shift now of not only we've exported the jobs, but we've exported fast food, we've exported oh. TV, we've exported, you know, screen time. So you, now you're seeing these countries, you know, India, Thailand, Indonesia, Mexico, are dealing with these huge issues related to obesity and onset diabetes. So is that something you've paid attention to by being from being both in fitness and public health? It, oh, absolutely. I mean, when I, so I did a study abroad program at Stanford um, for former major, um, and I was in Costa Rica and this was in 1998, I think was the first time I went. Um, and w one of the things that struck me the most was, was that like, especially, you know, a small country like Costa Rica in 1998, like I wasn't expecting to see so much Americanization of a lot of things. And so, um, I ended up doing, you know, my research for my honor thesis there and kind of looking at body image and what people's ideals were around and granted this was like an undergrad honors thesis and now like look back at the, my research and I'm like what the hell was I thinking <laughs> <laughs> you know now that I know so much more about research but you know at the time <laughs> I was just a young little undergrad oh uh, but it made, it made sense and one of the things I think in a place like Costa Rica and in certain developing countries is having a little bit of extra weight was seen as a sign of kind of a, as wealth that they're a little bit more well to do because you have a little extra a little extra the, weight and and but the older what, generation yeah. And isn't it surprising, though, but you see the Americanization where now you'll see these kids or you'll see, you know, drinking two two liter bottles of soda. You'll see them eating it at fast food. How did you spend how much time do you spend in Costa Rica and, and how did that affect your approach to this? 
Well, the first time I was there, I was, I was there for six months and this was in 1998. And there was already like, you know, I, I mean, I could immediately tell there was a lot of Americanization, not just in terms of fast food and all of that, but just in terms of ideals of, of what was beautiful and the body. And that, that was something that was always like super fascinating to me. Um, and that's what I, so I ended up going back. So I went for six months during my junior year and I ended up going back the summer after my junior year to do my research in quotes, <laughs> um, for my honors thesis. And that's what I looked at. Like I had basically created this, um, you know, sort of questionnaire survey thing. And I would sit with, um, women of different ages and, and talk to them about what they considered to be beautiful and what their ideals were in terms of body. And it it was so interesting because the, the older generations were all, you know, if you ask them like, you know, give me an example of someone that you consider to be beautiful. It was like my mother, mother Teresa, or, you know, you know, something along those lines. And the younger ones at the time, again, 1998 was like Britney Spears and, you know, all these American stars. And I was like, what, you know, in the magazines and, you know, and, and that's kind of initially what struck me to even do the research was like looking at the magazines. And, you know, I was in a gym when I was there, of course, because I was already in fitness and, you know, I took fitness classes while I was there and I taught some fitness classes while I was there. And, um, I ended up going, I have now, like I've gone back ever since then. So I've been going there for 20 years. Oh wow! Um, yeah, it's interesting. And, uh, you know, it's, it's become obviously even more Americanized, but even in 1998, I was shocked at how much it was then. And then when, with that, so you go to school and you study public health, how do you feel, is there much of emergence? Because in, when I was in DC and for listeners, you know, sorry to bring up DC again, cause sometimes I go back to DC <laughs> roots. But when I was in DC in, in the early 2000s, I started going to um, HHS, Department of Health and Human Services, would have open meetings to the President's Fitness Council. And I, in 2002, I did a, um, a thing, a, a demo at the White House. George Bush, um, you know, look, I, I, there are many things I didn't agree with President Bush on, but he was very active and he made fitness an important part of his daily schedule. So that's mm-hmm. one thing where I fundamentally agreed with him on. But I got to be at the White House and did a demonstration, you know, in front of in front of the president and the White House staff. So I was really tuned into that. But what what occurred to me, and the reason why I bring this up, Shauna, and, and one one of the things that fascinated me about your background was you have public health looking at how do we get people more active. You have the CDC, you have you know the um, Department of Agriculture coming out with the MyPlate recommendations. So there's a lot of there's a lot of awareness that we need pe- people to move more. Yet the fitness industry is in a completely different silo. It's like they're not even in the same in the in the same planet. So, you know, with, with this extensive, you know, with, with your PhD in public health, what can we be doing better to integrate like public and, you know, public government resources or sorry, government programs with private resources like health clubs? Because you teach for a couple of health clubs and, and you've taught for a YMCA, which is, a you know, it's a it's a nonprofit organization, but it's still in an essence a private health club. What can we be doing better to kind of integrate the government with the, the private resources? I mean, I think there's so many things that we need to be doing um, on on many levels. I think, you know, I've had this conversation um, with some people at Hopkins just because, you know, number one, I wasn't really intending on staying in the fitness industry. I was intending on being in academia, but I got so burned out after doing two masters and a PhD back to back. I was like, "Eh, I'm going to take a little break for a second. I'm just going to teach and take some time off. Um, and then, you know, then it was sort of a snowball effect between, you know, getting sponsored by Under Armour, who I was with until the end of 2016 and, you know, starting to work with brands and, you know, coming up with all of these different things and the sort of the social media and fitness and all of that, that kind of came about. And, you know, I ended up staying partially because, you know, I had started this Instagram challenge and I felt like, the, the touch point of what I could do to actually get to people and, and get messaging to people was so much more tangible in social media versus, you know, if I'm in academia and I'm doing all of this research and it may or may not get published and if it gets published, it may or may not get used. And if it gets used, it may or may not actually reach the people. That's a lot of like, uh, what ifs? <laughs> That's a lot of layers in there. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, three or four layers removed, you know, yeah. from starting and, a study and getting it published. Know, and at the time I, it's not like I had, you know, I had a few thousand followers or whatever, but like at least, at least I knew that I was touching, you know, say like a hundred people and a hundred people is way better than like 
four, like you're saying, like four layers removed from potentially not touching anyone with any kind of information. Um, but as I like sort of continued in, in that realm, one of the things that I have noticed even more, especially as, you know, fitness has exploded and yoga too on Instagram, um, is two things. One, I don't think that public health as an industry, as academics, as whatever you want to phrase that, hasn't really considered what's going on in social media. Number one, they don't really, I don't really think that public health is using social media in a way that's been super helpful yet. I feel like they're starting to catch on a little bit, but not, not in a way that is going to really catch people's attention. And at the same time, I also think that fitness has sort of lost this public health aspect of it, right? It's becoming a much more elite sort of, um, world, right? Like there's the, and, and, and I'm part of it and I fully admit that, you know, like I, I love teaching at boutique studios, like, because I love to teach, I love to be around people. I love, you know, and I love that fitness is becoming such a mainstream, um, uh, it's not just a mainstream sort of activity, but it's also just, it's part of the mainstream culture and the, the speak and everything that we do about fitness is becoming much more, um, common. However, it doesn't, it's not necessarily reaching all of the people that it needs to reach, right? Because we, when you talk about a boutique fitness class that costs 30 to $40 a class, and you know, we're talking about yoga pants that cost you know, a hundred dollars and your avocado toast that costs $10, don't know why, <laughs> but you know, like, all of these things. And again, it, you know, I'm not saying like, I'm, I'm some, you know, I'm above all of those things and I don't play into them. Of course, you know, like I love avocado toast. I love my yoga leggings. Like, it's not like I don't like those things, but at the same time, it's, you know, as someone who's, who's really studied public health and who's like, you know, I, I have dealt with a lot of, you know, Latin American studies and Latinos, uh, population was like a very big part of what I was studying all through, you know, sort of my, my, my entire career in academia, um, and sort of reaching the populations that really don't have access to those things, I think is super important as well as just getting those messages out there. I do think that the one thing that, you know, has been not the one thing, but one of the the great things about, um, you know, sort of the Instagram, social media, very commonplace conversation of, fitness is that there is a trickle down effect, right? Like there, there is this, like, you know, if, if the, those who, who can and will are talking about it so much, then, then it does trickle down to the, the populations that, you know, may not have the access to those things, but they can, they can, you know, sort of find access to other things. And so that's kind of been, one of the things that like, I feel like really needs to happen is that fitness needs to have a little bit more public health in it and public health needs to really understand what's going on in the actual industry of fitness. Um, and I, I feel like because I've kind of played a role in both and I can see both from each angle, you know, I, that's one of the, the, the ways that I'm trying to go now. It's like, how can I, you know, use my public health background and my, you know, my access to the academic academics that are, actually doing this research and, you know, working on projects and, you know, creating foundations and, and centers and things like that. How can I, you know, give them the voice of what it's, what's going on in this world of, of fitness and yoga and wellness and, you know, social media and all of that so that they can, they can either consider it and, or, you know, utilize it. And at the same time, like, how can I, in the fitness industry, be someone who actually does consider the things that need to be considered from public health, you know, in terms of access, in terms of um, the way, the communication styles, in terms of the types of language that we use, and in terms of, like, what the real importance of movement is, and, you know, like, all of that kind of thing. So, you know, I feel like that's, that's where I'm really trying to go, is trying to bridge that gap a little bit, because I think... It, it's it's really needed, and I think it's only going to become more needed as this continues. Well, it's a huge gap, Shauna, because you know because I have had a background and I did some policy work, and one of the jobs I had before I got into fitness was with the bicycle industry. Back in 1997, I worked on a campaign. It was at the Rails to Trails offices, 
And it was, part, it was sponsored by all the major bike manufacturers. It was one of the first times that the president of Trek and the president of Specialized had been in the same room with each other for the same purpose. This was back in the mid to late 90s, like I said, 97. But what they wanted to do was to get 1% of the transportation budget set aside for bike rail, you know, for bike lanes and, and bike trails. And that was my first kind of like, and that was again, before I, I even got into fitness, but that was my first insight. And I thought about going to get a master's degree in public planning or in urban planning to yeah. start working on how can we do better urbanize around trails and around, you know, these feasible, these, these areas where we can exercise. But it was really insightful to see that, that you can have, it goes back to the planning of what a government does. Like here in San Diego County for the last couple of years, they've been implementing a bike program that has some of the people up in arms because it's taking lanes off the roads, but that's a slowing traffic down and B giving cyclists a safe, you know, a safe lane to commute in. And that's one thing that a government can do that kind of bridges the gap between what you've studied, public health, between transportation, which is a whole other field, and between fitness. Because, you know, when I worked, you know, I used to live in downtown San Diego and used to ride my bike two or three times a week to my office, the American Council on Exercise, which is about nine miles away. And I had to go a very circuitous route to make sure I stayed in bike lanes because I didn't trust other drivers. But, you know, I'm kind of giving you that as, as a background and, and to ask, because you're in Oakland, and one of the things that I think is really unique about Oakland, or maybe you can tell us, what has Oakland done recently? Because I've seen it on, on social media. I'm not sure if I've seen it on yours, but hasn't Oakland created a whole outdoor exercise area? And, you know, have you have you done anything or you're, I don't know if you, I know you probably haven't been involved with that, but is that something that kind of has raised your awareness about how these two areas can merge? Um, well, I actually don't know about okay. that. Um, uh, you know, I know that there's, there there are a, in San Francisco for sure. There's um, a little outdoor fitness area that I know is like trying to sort of expand across the country and um, kind of do that kind of thing. But you know, I think I think the cities do play a huge role in in sort of creating an environment that people feel like that they want to engage in any kind of movement or activity, and that it's safe and you know from for all of the different things that that need to be considered, but. You know, I also think that there's there's something to say for creating spaces where people can hold classes, you know, that that maybe aren't as expensive as boutique fitness classes, you know, and granted this, I, this is a California girl speaking, right? Like, yeah. I understand that in New York, you can't do that in the winter, <laughs> whereas here you could probably could. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think that there's there's a lot of like the, the city planning type stuff that you you're talking about that can, that can happen. But it's also, you know, I just think that there's, I don't really know exactly what the solution is yet, but one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is like, you know, I don't see boutique fitness going away anytime soon. And I don't, uh, you know, I would never wish it away. Like I, again, I, I think it's great that it's become such a huge part of a, a lot of people's lives, but like what, what can that, aspect of fitness do to, to help their community, right. For the people that are in that community that maybe can't come to a class, you know, is it offering free classes? Is it, you know, going to parks? I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but you know, I do think that there's, there's room there for the boutique sort of fitness side to, to do stuff like that. And I think one of the things that's really hard with public health too, and it, 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 speaking of government and we, we know the things that happen with government in terms of funding and in terms, you know, like I know how hard it is for people to get funding to do public health research and to, you know, implement programs and, and to, you know, evaluate those programs and, and continue the research beyond just like, Oh, okay, we're going to put this here and leave it there and nothing else is done. We don't know if it works or not, you know? Um, and it's interesting because then I, you know, then being in the fitness industry where it's like, there's so much money floating around and I'm like, well, okay, there's all this money over here and there's no research being done over here because there's no money over here. And I'm like, what is happening? You know? Well, and it's Well, on that note real quick, and first of all, I want to apologize. I wasn't trying to get you with the Oakland Park thing. I just didn't know. Well, you're more Berkeley, so I wasn't sure if you, or, no, you said you live in Oakland, correct? I'm in Oakland, yeah. Okay. I, I'm not often home. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'm sure. And I, so I wasn't, you know, but it's been one of those things. And I'm, I was thinking maybe it, it, it's another friend of mine's social media that, that I've seen her do some of the things on. 
but it's like a relatively new park. Uh, I'm not sure where in Oakland, but it's a well, relatively. I'm gonna have to find it now. Yeah, because it has <laughs> like. A, it, there. Look for it. Yeah, it has a lot of it has a lot of outdoor. It has like a lot of the pull up bars, dip bars, and other stuff. Um, but you know, one of the things to, we were just talking What? Oh, now I just totally blanked on that, but I, what I wanted to hit on was what you're talking about in terms of study. And what that is, is coming up in, you know, before long this in the spring, the health club industry association, URSA, URSA, which is the international health and racket sports club association. First of all, I've been to a couple of their legislative meetings because of my legislative background. I've been to a couple of legislative meetings where they're trying to get what, what they want to be able to do is have people's, um, health savings account. And so if you're listening, you might want to pay attention to this. What the Health Club Industry Association wants to do is for you to have your health savings account to be able to pay for studio classes, to be able to pay for your club dues, your health club dues, to be able to pay for personal trainers. Because right now, the way it's written is your health savings account can't do that. Your health savings account can be spent on medical expenses, but unless that changed, I might have changed under the, the 2010 law. Um, Affordable Care Act, but I don't think it changed it all the way because they're still advocating for it. But what they're trying to do, Sean, is they're trying to get, you know, they're trying to get tax free money to be able to be spent on the fitness industry. So that way, maybe a family with a tight budget could find a few dollars in their budget if it's tax free to be able to join a health club or be able to take classes. And and the thing that I've always lamented with the Health Club Industry Association is they don't talk about it in terms of jobs. They always talk about it in terms of like promoting health. But I'm like, because all of a sudden, if you had a, a reason for people to join more boutique studios, how many more jobs would boutiques create? Mm, yeah. I mean, significantly, right? And then the other thing that we're about to do and where I wanted to go with, with the, is the excessive waste is every year the, the, the Health Club Industry Association does their annual trade show. Well, these equipment companies spend upwards of seven figures to do a trade show booth to feature all their new equipment. When in reality, all they've really done is maybe change a display that has a wider TV screen, which we can have a whole different conversation about that. But right, right. It, it, you know, it was like a couple of years ago. I left. I, I left. The trade show was in L.A. and I left L.A. and I was I was going. I was uh, my next door neighbor's band was playing at a place in Hollywood, so I was going over to Hollywood. And it was funny because I left this trade show of all this brand new, beautiful fitness equipment that companies spent tens of thousands, and hundreds of thousands of dollars to get to the convention center. And I'm driving down maybe Olympic Boulevard. I forget what it was. And I'm seeing, you know, it wasn't necessarily the poverty, but I'm seeing all these people that aren't being reached by the fitness industry yet need the benefits of some type of physical activity in their life. And I think yeah. that's where you, I mean, that, that exemplifies the disconnect. You know, so I think you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. And I think that's why, you know, somebody with your background and, and, and your knowledge is so unique. And that takes me to how'd you get started on Instagram? What, what got you into Instagram and, and, you know, kind of how have you, how's that helped you evolve in terms of not only a brand, but in terms of as, as an instructor? You know, I, I was sort of on, I want to say on the early end of the fitness and yoga part of Instagram, I was not, I was not an early adopter of Instagram period. I was just like, I don't understand why I need this. I have Facebook. It's all the same thing. And then, <laughs> you know, you know, I'm sure a lot of us, that, that, you know, this is back in, I want to say like 2012 or 2013, I can't remember. Um, but you know, the second that I got on there, I, um, I, there was this in, Instagram challenge called yoga a day back mm. in what it was like one of the early, early, um, Instagram challenges for fitness, uh, or yoga, I guess at the time. <clears throat> and I loved it, you know, and I would do, I would do the pose every day and, you know, I would try to be as creative as possible because I don't like to do things the normal way. For some reason, I just always have to, <laughs> I always have to do it differently. So I would try to be as creative as possible. And then I did that for like a couple months and I would get some features here and there from that. But then I kept thinking like, why is no one doing this for fitness? And it wasn't that there wasn't you know, people doing things and trying to challenge other people that that was definitely already happening. There was like, you know, some of the, the, like Massey, um, was already doing a lot of her stuff, you know, and she's, she's been killing it ever since. But, um, you know, there wasn't this sort of, here's one thing to do a day for fitness that combined both fitness and yoga. And it was right as I got sponsored by Under Armour. And so I approached them and was like, Hey, what if we did some sort of challenge that was like both fitness and yoga and, you know, let's call it sweat a day. I, I, I don't even, I don't, it's so funny now that I think about it, but, um, and they were like, okay, you know, sure. And so they just kind of helped me promote and this again, early days of Instagram and, and fitness being a thing. Um, you know, I 
put, it was super basic back then too. It was like push up, pull up, like, you know, warrior one. Like it was just really, really, really basic. I did it for the first month and they were like, okay, well let's add in some prizes. And so then we started adding in prizes and then it started picking up steam and the more people started joining it. And we took like a, a short little break because they were focusing on some campaign and then came back and it ran for three years every wow. day. Yeah. And you know, it became, it, it was just like this, to me, that was like the ultimate combination for myself of what I was doing in terms of public health and in terms of fitness, because I was able to give one movement that like, if you were a brand new beginner, never got off, never did any kind of, you know, movement at all, you you could do one thing, you know, and that was kind of the premise of the whole thing. Like you could do this and do it once, and it's something, something is better than nothing. And that's very public healthy, right? Like do, do one thing. Well, just um, uh, one moment on that. Cause that's the one, that, when I do quotes and I'm still a media spokesperson for the American council and exercise, that's the one thing I always come back to is a little something is better than a lot of nothing. Exactly. Yeah, and that's just that little message. So go ahead about your, your, your Instagram yeah. development. And so, you know, I, I really wanted it to be that, but then I also wanted to access those badass people that wanted to, you know, to do all kinds of crazy things. And so I never gave a specific amount for the number of reps, the number of the amount of time. I just always gave, this is the instructions on how to do it. So as an instructor, it was really good for me to like constantly be writing out how to perform an exercise, right? Because then every time I speak it, it's much easier for me because I've already written it. I've already written out so many things. It helps me in my communication style, but then, you know, people who, who were in the gym for hours at a time could add that into their workout. Right. And so it just sort of developed from that. And then there was like, you know, people's grandparents started doing it and people's kids started doing it. I went and visited some classrooms where the entire classroom was doing it. My, one of my friends was teaching and, um, she had her whole class do it. And then it ended up being that the whole school was doing it for their morning announcements. And, you know, they do this one movement every day and, you know, it was, it, it, they loved the burpees. I mean, it was, it was like it, the ultimate, this is what, this is why I'm doing what I do, you know? Um, and then after three years I was like, ah, oh, I kind of need a break, but then, <laughs> you know, it's like, I've, I've brought it back a little bit more recently just because like, I really miss that sort of interaction between people and, you know, that by itself, just because I was constantly giving content that was, you know, instructional, um, got me a lot of features on different things. And that's kind of how it just kind of exploded from there. Um, and then different brands and, you know, then I, I not because of Instagram, but, you know, I started working with TRX and, you know, to so help them develop some of their TRX for yoga content and like all of that. So it just kind of exploded from there, but it was, it's really like, you know, now there's all these bots and you can buy likes and buy followers and all, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> I did it the hard way back in the day. You know? um, <laughs> Grinding it out and doing one or yeah. another. I just, yeah. just for the record, I've had a uh, Chris Frankel, who's the VP of uh, performance. Yeah. I've had him on the, on the podcast and uh, I just recently had Randy on again. Randy was talking about the, the program they developed with Weston hotels. So I'm, I'm good buds with the, with the folks at TRX. I didn't realize you had, yeah, I didn't realize you've been working closely with that. How'd you, yeah. get, how'd you transition? So to take a step out of public health, let's get into yoga. Now, how'd you transition from step into yoga? What first got you into yoga? Well, I started doing yoga back in college. Um, I had severe anxiety attacks my senior year in um, college. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that, that was suggested was try yoga. And so I started doing yoga. It was my senior year. Um, and so it was like, oh, I had only been teaching fitness for four years at that point. Um, so it was super early on, but I, I started doing it. I did it for like three years and then someone passed out in a class that I was in. Um, and it scared me even more because I was like, I already have anxiety and now I have anxiety about passing out in yoga. And like, so I stopped doing yoga for like three years. Unfortunately, that was the same three years that overlapped me being in LA with some of oh, the, wow. you know, the now amazing, amazing instructors that I could have like taken class from when they were, when they were like just beginning, um, including some of my friends, but you know, that's neither here nor there, but I ended up getting back into yoga, um, when I started my PhD, because I was like, I literally will not get through this degree if I don't have this, like if it weren't for fitness and yoga, I would not have been able to get through school period, you know, and people while I was in school were like, why are you going to still teach while you're, you know, doing a PhD and whatever. And I was like, 
because if I don't, I won't do this PhD. <laughs> it just won't happen. Um, but because the yoga, you know, certification is much more entailed, um, I really wanted to be able to commit the time to do it. So it was kind of my present to myself when I finished my PhD was to get my yoga certification. So I had already been doing yoga for a really long time up until then. I just hadn't actually gotten my certification. So, so you would, so that was that before the, they had the RYT requirement because that's only been the last like six, seven years, I think. That it was had. right time that RYT started. So like I, yeah, mine was an RYT 200 and then okay. now I'm 500. So yeah. And that just, what that means for, for listeners is, is, you know, up until a number of years ago, there was no real professional certification or accreditation process for yoga instructors. Um, it was like almost anybody could say I'm a yoga instructor and what RYT is what that's like registered yoga training or something like that. I forget what it is. Yep. Registered yoga teacher. A registered yoga teacher. But, uh, you know, if anybody wants to learn more about that process, I think one of my early podcasts with Jessica Matthews, who created a, a college course program for yoga, uh, you guys can listen to, to that whole process. Now, the one thing I, I really think was unique, hip-hop yoga. Talk about hip-hop yoga. Yeah. So it's funny because a lot of people are like, I, I, I think that especially now because you know, so many different variations of yoga exist and, and different takes on it. Um, people are, I think kind of assume that I just did it because I was like, Oh, this will be really fun and trendy. And really ultimately I'm a hip hop head. So I don't teach anything without hip hop. Like I don't do anything without hip hop. I am the person who was listening to, I had a special playlist right before I gave, I gave my dissertation talk, you know, to, to defend my dissertation. Like I, like I, that is my world and nothing, it, it just doesn't, I couldn't do anything without it. So, um, I wanted to create a class that was basically, you know, and, and my class, I call it muscle and flow. And it's, it's essentially a combination of like a vinyasa class with a power class with a little bit of Pilates with a little bit of like plyometrics. So it's like essentially like me, <laughs> you know, like I do a little bit of everything and it's, it's pretty athletic and, you know, it's, to, it's all to hip hop. And, you know, there's, there's people who will say, Oh, well, it's not traditional yoga. And, and, and that's fine. You know, I also think that the yoga community and the yoga world sometimes is a little daunting to people. And I also wanted to, again, coming back to access and coming back to sort of feeling like you belong. I wanted to create something that would, would be almost like a gateway, right. For people to come into that world. And, you know, if, if it's, if it's something where you're like, listen, I'm going to come to this class because you play Tupac and Biggie and, you know, that's the only reason why I'm here. Great. Fine. Come, you know, again, a little bit is better than nothing. So if you're coming and you're getting into that world, like I had a lot of people who I think initially just came in for (laughs) sort of that athletic, you know, yoga workout, even though it's not really a workout, but like, you know, like that's within their minds, that's what they thought. And then ended up, you know, going on to becoming teachers themselves. Like, you know, I think it's, um, it's just a different way to, to give a perspective on, you know, this is, this is how I move. This is, this is what I love. And I know that there's other people that do too. And, um, you know, it's, is it a yin class? No, it's not. Um, and I'm very upfront about that. You know, the description fully says that this is exactly what you're going to get. And, you know, I, it, it's not that I think that any other yoga is bad or wrong or any of that. It's, and, and they shouldn't think that of mine either. You know, it's, it's just a different way of, of moving with it. Um, but it's been, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed seeing people who come in who may not have stepped into a yoga class for other reasons, you know? Um, and, and I think that that's super important. That's athletes, you know, that's, you know, I've taught, I've taught it at, um, some, boutique gyms where, you know, it's a more of a boot camp style class that they normally teach. And, and those types of, you know, people are looking for something that's super hardcore, but they really need some other, other sort of more mentally and physically relaxing sort of, um, moves as well. And, you know, the blend I think is, is key for them because it's, it mentally, they're like, okay, I can do this because it's, it's got some other stuff in it. Um, well, well, let me ask you a question on that. Do you tend to get a lot of guys in, in muscle and flow because yeah, it's more hip hop oriented? Yeah. It's funny that you, you asked that there. I remember, and I actually have a picture somewhere on Facebook, um, of this day. There was a day where one of the classes I was teaching where there were more men than there were women. And it was, it was like, there was like 22 guys and, you know, like 20 women or something. Um, 
And, and that was like such a proud moment for me because again, it's, it's whether it's men, whether it's, you know, people who think that yoga is strictly for some elite, you know, population or whatever it is. Um, you know, I think getting, getting those people in class is, is so important because yoga is such an amazing, beautiful practice that, that really is beneficial to everybody, but not everybody feels like they can, that they belong there always. Um, and, and I think that that was kind of just my, my way of being like, if you are in this world and you understand this and you feel like you don't belong, then let me try to get you to feel like you do belong. So well, yes, I get a lot of guys. And, and one of the things that, that I've, I've had a number of yoga, not a number, but I've had some yoga instructors on the podcast, Shauna. And I have to admit, you know, as a reformed, I call myself a recovering meathead because, you know, in my early twenties and this, then we'll close up with this. Cause I want to ask you one or two questions, kind of what you started with. Because in my early 20s, it was all about strength, how much I could lift, how, how big you could get and all that. And now that I'm in my 40s, I'm halfway through my 40s, it's more about mobility. It's more about, you know, how well do I move? Can I sync yep. my, with what my hips and my shoulders are doing? And, and I posted this on Facebook recently, maybe a month or two ago, um, to, to, to my friends on Facebook was, if you could go back in time, because I was watching what, what spurred it is there, there are a bunch of the, the bros home from college doing their college workouts at, at the local gym. And, you know, it's it funny watching like the young 20 something meatheads, you know, they're in their cutoff tank tops and they're, they're blowing, you know, they're, you know, blasting their guns and they're flexing in front yep. of the mirror. And it was different than the usual crowd. And I'm like, I was just thinking, I'm like, man, if I could go back to my 20 something self, I would just whisper in my ear, take yoga, start taking yeah. yoga and work yeah. on mobility. Because when I do it now and I go through practices, cause I'm very particular about the instructor in the room if it's too hot and everybody anyway that's my own issue um but i I enjoy it because it really is it's challenging it's moving and i think if for no other reason people take an hour out of their day to focus on breathing and moving without their device i think yoga pays significant dividends and is that your experience with it oh 100 percent. like i again if it weren't for fitness and yoga number one i would not have finished any of my grad school so I think mentally for me, that's a huge thing. Physically, you know, I, you know, I'm 40, so <laughs> I have to, you know, there's a lot of recovery type stuff that I need to do. There's a lot of, you know, preventative things that I, that I need to do. And I think yoga, yoga for me has always been more mental than anything, but the physical benefits of it are, are obvious. You know, it's, it, I do a lot of explosive movement. I do a lot of running. I do a lot of, you know, various things that the body is going to need some, <laughs> some TLC for. And, you know, I think that yoga is a great way to do that. Um, I also just think in terms of, you know, like I always try to explain to people that both yoga and Pilates really like, you know, you're, you're, you're strengthening, stabilizing muscles. And if you are trying to do anything where you're using your larger muscle groups, like having strong stabilizers <laughs> is a good thing. Um, you know, it definitely, definitely helps. Yeah. <laughs> it helps a little bit. Um, so, you know, I think yoga is, is great for all of that, but, you know, for me, it's always been much more of like a, a mental reset. It's like, get really into my, it's also where I learn what's going on in my body because Mm. I may not be paying as much attention when I'm out on a run or, you know, I'm flipping tires or doing box jumps of like, Oh, that feels a little weird. Or, Oh, like I feel much more open here than I did before. You know, like I'm not thinking about those types of things. Whereas when I'm in yoga, like I am fully in like, Oh, my, you know, my hips not turning quite the way that it used to, or like, this is, seems a little bit more, you know, whatever it might be. Like I'm fully present with what is going on. And it's kind of my like checks and balances of really pay attention and mentally too, you know, of like where, where am I getting stuck? Where is my ego coming in more than it needs to? And all of those things. And, you know, I've, I've had a severe injury. I tore all three hamstring tendons off my bone. Oh. What were you doing when you did that? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I was running in the middle of Times Square and all three popped. And it, yeah, I, I didn't know that that's what was, I didn't know that's what happened for another two weeks. Um, but, you know, like it, it, my yoga had obviously changed. I did not have surgery. I um, sort of rehabbed it myself and, and with my chiropractor and my acupuncturist and my PT and, you know, just built some scar tissue instead of a tendon, whatever. Yeah. No, but that, I mean, that, that works because scar tissue is similar to connective tissue. It just needs to matrix a little bit differently. Yeah. And so, you know, kind of moving through what that means in my practice and, and how yoga can help with that and seeing the, the various ways that my body has adapted 
um, good and bad, <laughs> um, because of that injury, like it's been really helpful for that too. Like, I, I mean, I can't say enough good things about yoga. So, well on that note, cause you started off saying, and I think a lot of us did Shauna, cause I know I certainly did, you know, got into fitness, obviously you know, as, as we referred to already as a young man, you, you, you sort of try to build up this certain, you know, and I, I came of age and I've talked about this in other podcasts. I came of age in the Schwarzenegger movies where everybody had yep. huge muscles and, and whatever. Yep. And, and to me, the journey of fitness has been, now I'm kind of on this a- approach where I'm trying to get people to think less about a goal. Like, you know, because you mentioned, this, you know, you said something right on that really resonated because we, I think a lot of people coming into fitness with these preconceived notions of, I need to have a goal to lose weight, or I need to have a goal to, to look a certain way. And yeah. really my message to people would be, let's change the goal to enjoying the process. So you alluded to having a little bit of an image issue early uh, on, and, and I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to go into, if, you, if you're not comfortable going into it, we certainly don't have to, but how is that, like, how has your approach to fitness evolved from being a young person, which, you know, we all were, where we thought where fitness was all about image. And then now to where we are in our forties, where for me personally, fitness is about vitality and about if I'm fit, I have options for what I can do in my life. How is your, you know, kind of your journey, how have you evolved with your approach to fitness? I mean, I think you just hit the nail on the head. You know, I, I definitely came into it completely for aesthetic ideals. And, you know, you talk about the Schwarzenegger age, I would say I was more of the, like, you know, the, the fat free, like this and that, you know, all of the things that happened in the late nineties with what we were trying to do and the, the physical ideals, like I, you know, couldn't have seen a lower number. Like I just wanted the lowest number possible on that scale. And I like lived and died almost by that scale, you know, and I haven't weighed myself since I was 14, um, on purpose. And, you know, I, I feel like movement, even though I, I arrived at it with this completely in my mind, just imbalance of, of what, what movement can really do and, and understand it and understanding of what movement can do to uh, such an appreciation for what the body is capable of. You know, I mean, I, going back to that injury, I just described the fact that your body can create scar tissue to reattach a muscle to a bone, like that is nuts. But I also think that had I not been so into my body and actually been able to, you know, train my body the way I have, I don't know that that would have, like, I I don't know that I wouldn't have been able to do that without surgery. You know, like I think the, the capabilities of the body and sort of understanding that it is a constant process and that like, you know, I literally wake up and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do today? What can I try to get better at? You know? And that's, that's how, that's how I look at movement, but that's also just how, how I look at the world in general. But it's because I have this really anchored, you know, sense of, of being in my body. And I feel like when I was younger, it was more that I was out of my body, looking at my body, Mm. you know, and looking at it in this way of, of just, you know, to be quite honest, disgust for no reason. Like I think about it now and it just makes me cry for my younger self, but, you know, looking at it with this, like, you know, sort of disgust and, and also just disrespect completely of, of what this whole thing is. And, you know, now I feel like instead of looking at my body, I'm like living through my body and, and actually able to really understand how each movement weighs into the rest of my life. You know, I also think, you know, learning, learning the process, as you said, is, is that process has, again, goes going back to academia, that process of training helped in academia. It helped because there was moments where I was like, I cannot do this anymore. Like I'm over it. But how many times do you get to that point where you're just like, oh, I'm running this hill. I can't do this anymore. But you're like, I'm almost at the top of the hill. I'm going to get there, you know? And it's like, you get there, however you get there. Like it may not be as fast as you wanted to. It may not be the way that you wanted to, but you're going to get there. And I think that, that, that is like a, a, a mental piece of fitness and of training and of being in your body that you really have to experience in order for it to like come out in all of these different ways. And, you know, the process itself is so unbelievable. And, you know, I take something like a headstand or a handstand in yoga where could you just throw yourself up there and probably almost hit it? A lot of people probably could, 
but that is, that's skipping the entire concept of what it means to train to get there in a way that really makes sense. And that's safe for your body. Like you could throw yourself up into a headstand and, you know, you could also fall over and roll over on your neck and that might not be so good for you, you know, but, um, you know, learning and I, and I teach headstand in a very, very progressive way. And I tell people all the time, stop wherever you feel like you need to stop. Because if you you don't feel like you can keep going safely, then you probably shouldn't keep going safely. <laughs> I think that that's a really important lesson and our egos get in the way. And I get that, you know, um, we all want the Instagram photo, but you know, it's, it's, it's the process of, of every little aspect of it and it's ups and downs, right? Like some days, you know, like I just was dealing with this like Achilles calf thing that, you know, I mean, I'm 40, like, you know, like I'm, I'm still doing all of these things and it, things happen, but it's, it's this being in your body, I think is something that you, you just can't replace. Like there's nothing that will teach you more than being exactly who you are in the skin that you're in. Um, and it sounds like a dub commercial, but like, you know, I, I just think that we are so detached from ourselves because we want the physical to look a certain way. We want the appearance of our entire lives to look a certain way. We want the perfect avocado toast picture. We want all of these things. And it's, you know, what is that really doing for you in your, in your being? Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that's like such an important thing that movement really, you, you know, if you're, if you're really moving in a way that's like to the core of who you are, there's no way that you're going to not be able to pay attention and, and, find out all of those things about yourself. Well, and so if my advice to, to my 20 something self would be to take yoga, what would your advice to your 20 something self be in terms of movement and fitness? Oh man. Uh, I mean, you know, these questions are always hard for me because I'm like, I feel like those lessons that I had to learn because of the decisions that I made and because of the insecurities that I had led me here you know, and it gave me a way of being able to understand where other people who have those insecurities and whatever that, where they're coming from right now. So, you know, my, my advice honestly would be to do nothing different. Like I obviously would, would prefer to have not had these insecurities and not, you know, have put my body through some of the things that I put it through and to have, you know, trained more and paid attention to, you know, certain things, but I don't know that I would be here where I am and in the position that I am in, in a way that, that I'm able to, you know, meet people where they are, if I hadn't have done things the wrong way. <laughs> well, and I think that, that, that's, that's very insightful. I mean, that's very insightful is I think we all have our journey and it, it got us here. And then I want to, you know, be respectful of your time, Shauna, and, and, you know, wrap it up. But this is the last, cause as I want to continue this conversation, if you're fine with it, I want to yeah. reach back out to you in a couple months and just connect. And, and really, like I said, I want to be able to give, you know, you're connecting with people in a way that other people in the fitness industry aren't, you know I mean? You're connecting with people via social media, and this is still such a new experience for everybody. And I think one of the most powerful things about social media is the vicarious experience is people that can relate to you, seeing you do something or seeing other people in your feed do something. They feel like if she can do it or he can do it, then I can do it too. Would you agree? That's one of the powerful things about social media. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's very easy to look at a picture or look at a video and be like, oh, well, you know, she's, you know, been able to do this her whole life. Like, like I said, I wrote extra credit reports in PE in junior high because I couldn't <laughs> run a mile. I couldn't do a pull up. I couldn't, you know, and now, you know, I couldn't do a pull up until I was, I think like 32 or 34. Wow. And okay. so, you know, people, people all, and I honestly thought I was one of those people that just was never going to be able to do a pull up. I'm like, uh, I'm just, I'm just not that person. My arms are too long, you know, like whatever it is, which is true. But I have really long arms, but, um, you know, I, I think being really honest about, about what that process looks like and about the fact that like, it didn't just didn't just happen. It's not like I just was like, Oh, you know, I was born to be this. I, I don't, maybe I was, I don't know, but I, I definitely had to go through the process. Like, and I still go through the process, you know, and it's, um, I just think that being, being open about that. And, and I think people knowing that I really, I really am working at this all the time. Like, you know, I really am doing the training and it, you know, I, I think one of the things that's interesting is that people in the yoga community think I'm a little too fitness and people in the fitness community think I'm a little too yoga. And I love that, <laughs> you know, I love not fitting in either of them because 
to me, it's like, I want, I, I want to work on, you know, being more present in my practice and I want to work on being able to run faster up a hill and to be able to, you know, do all of the things that I do. And, and that is truly and honestly like who I am. So when I am posting things and people are seeing my process, they're really seeing my process. And, and last question to before before we sign off, and, and this is I think maybe the most important one of, of, of our conversation. We've, we've and I really appreciate your time and everything. But you grew up on the West Coast. You went to school in Johns Hopkins, which is Baltimore. So when yep. it comes to hip hop, which you prefer, East Coast or West Coast? Oh, West Coast, hands down. <laughs> hands down. And what's your go? Like what's your go to? What's your like number? No, the the hip hop song that kind of gets you, just like, and, and uh, you probably have more than one. But like, what's the I one do that? Have more than one. Yeah, but what's like um, kind of the one that just like your jam, for lack of a better term? Well, and I just said West Coast, and I'm about to give you an East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my favorite songs that it was actually on the playlist that I um, used right before I defended my dissertation is uh, Public Service Announcement by Jay-Z uh, because of the way that beat drops. That beat drops, and I feel like I can do anything, whether it's defend my dissertation or run up a hill or whatever. That, that's cool. All right. Well, Shauna, thank you very much. And, and obviously people probably know your Instagram, but if people want to follow you, uh, you know, f- learn out more, learn more about what you're doing, maybe where you're teaching in the Bay area, how can they do that? Um, so my Instagram is at Shauna underscore Harrison and that's S H A U N A. Um, and my website is just Shauna Um, and I tend to put up where I'm teaching and stuff. So I'll check you there. Okay. I'm a geek. Years ago, I may have tried, I may have you gotten upset if you called me a geek or a nerd or you said anything, you know, like that. And, but now I own that. You know, I enjoy talking about policy. I enjoy talking about the nitty gritty details of exercise science and, and motivational strategies and behavior change strategies. And in her bio, Sean is a self, uh, self-admitted geek too. I mean, she went to Hopkins and Stanford. I mean, how can you not be a geek? You have to be you. You have to be a geek just to even walk on the campuses of those institutions. But in all seriousness, this is a really helpful and insightful conversation to have, because as I mentioned, you know, for years you see public health talk about we need to do this, we need to do that to get more more people active. And if we look at commercial fitness, we look at the commercial fitness industry. The commercial fitness industry does some things very well. They create opportunities for people to be more active. Obviously, there's a profit incentive in there. Most health clubs, most you know, commercial health clubs are for profit. The nonprofit health clubs or nonprofit facilities, YMC, YMCA, the JCCs, various county and municipality rec departments, universities. You know, I don't know if anybody's aware of this or if you're aware of this, but now the university, the student recreation centers are amazing. You know, back when I went to college in the early 90s, <laughs> our weight room was like, a, I think it used to be a storeroom. Our weight room is in the back of the gymnasium. This was for students and athletes. And it was just basically a bunch of equipment without much thought into it. Go on to any major campus today and you will see fitness facilities that rival, you know, the most expensive health clubs out there. Like students make, sometimes make their decisions on where they go to school based on the fitness facilities. So there's been a lot of money invested in fitness on campus and campus recreation. Anyway, I say that because you have these different different groups of po- different populations of people that, that go to places to work out. You have the for-profit clubs and you have the not-for-profit clubs, which include you know 501c3 organizations like YMCA, JCC, and then you have all of your institutions of higher learning. But we're still missing something. You know, I mean, that's the one thing that was really interesting to talk to Shauna about about how she uses. Instagram to engage people and, and what that does. You know, she, she mentioned that she gets feedback and comments from people that inspire them to be more active. And, you know, by doing different things, by combining hip hop with yoga, it can be a way to, you know, yogi purists might not, you know, might be judgmental of that and, and maybe hip hop purists too. But if it gets people moving, I don't think there's any harm in it. I really don't. You know, I've really tried to lose the judgmental side of how I view fitness. You know, I certainly have my opinions about certain fitness practices or certain, you know, types of exercise, but the bottom line, the bottom line is the bottom line. The bottom line is I want you to be more active. I want you to take the steps to be healthier. 
If that means going for a walk around the block, well, God bless. You know, maybe today it's a block, maybe this week it's a block, maybe next week it's two blocks. You know, we all have to start somewhere. And keep in mind, fitness doesn't mean how you look. Fitness is the attitude. Fitness is that I can go out and do that attitude. I can learn yoga. You know, I can go out and play with my kids. I can go out and go for a hike. To me, that's fitness. You know, it's having the ability to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And so when we look at public health, I think public health is looking at how do we get people to be more active, but it's it's such a multifactorial issue. You know, I mentioned years ago, I worked for the bicycle industry and we worked on a, a transportation bill to try to get more money for bike paths and bike lanes. That can make a difference. You know, I live in San Diego County and for the last few years, San Diego County has been investing in bike lanes. They've made some roads safer for cyclists. Now, obviously, we need the drivers to pay attention (laughs) so they don't hit the cyclists. You know, one of the reasons I got, you know, one of the reasons I don't ride my bike as much as as I used to on the road is we have so many distracted drivers. I've had a couple of close calls. So I keep my bike in the dirt in the mountains. That's where I feel a little bit safer. I feel safer flying down down a dirt trail on my mountain bike than I do riding along the bike path on a shoulder of a, of a major road. But that's besides the point. That just is one of the factorials. You need to look in your community. That's where public health can have an impact because public health can do the research to say, hey, if we build more walking trails, if we build more parks, if we set aside some of our government money to build more parks, to build more walkways, people will be more active. If you build it, they will come. You know, I know that's a line from a cheesy early 90s movie, But it's true. I've seen that in various communities where I've lived. When you open a new park, guess what happens? People go there to play. You open a new bike path, guess what happens? People start riding their bikes on it. You build a bike lane along the side of a road. Some drivers may bitch and moan about losing a lane, but you're creating an opportunity for other people to be active. So if you're one of those drivers who think, you know, the road is for cars— Keep that in mind that that person riding their bike to work, that might be the only chance they have for being active that day. You know, they might have a lot of stuff going on at work and at home. And maybe the only workout, the only exercise they get is riding their bike five to seven miles each way to and from work. We have to allow that to happen. Now, they should be following the rules of the road. They should be safe and all that stuff. But, you know, we have to take everybody in consideration. And that's where public health can play a role. You know, where I think they miss the boat, though, is they just don't understand how to engage people. You know, as as I mentioned, I've been to public health meetings where people sit around all day. You know, they have crap, you know, they have, you know, pardon my French, but they have crap snacks. They have muffins, soda, and all that stuff in the back of the room. We're here to talk about public health and how to get people to move more. How about this? Let's, let's, Let's all get up and throw that crap in the garbage and get some decent snacks in here. Get some fruit and veggies and some water. So it's just, it's interesting to see kind of the culture around public health. Then we look at commercial health clubs. Commercial health clubs, honestly, yeah, some of them have their, their, their hearts in the right place, but they're there to make a buck. You know, they're, they're there to try to get more members in their facility. And they're there to try to engage some members. Some health clubs do it really well. And other health clubs really just see you as a dollar sign. You know, I'm sorry, but some of these low-cost health clubs... That cost twelve ninety five, you know, nine ninety five a month. They they don't care about you. They're predicated. Their business model is predicated on you buying a membership and not going. Some of the more expensive health clubs, they care about you. They have programming that engage you. They have a well trained staff that knows how to engage you. If you go shop one of those lower end health clubs, ask how long the salesperson's been working there. Ask how long the manager's been working there. I guarantee you, there's almost one hundred percent turnover every 12 to 18 months. You know, you might be paying $10 a month to go exercise there, <laughs> but it's not well run. I'd rather pay three times that. I'd rather pay five times that amount for a place that's well run, well managed, and, and respects its members. So that's all to say that there are a number of ways to get active. There are a number of ways you can be active in your community. I kind of threw Sean on a curveball there by mentioning a new park that was in Oakland. It's an outdoor park with all kinds of pull-up and dip stations there. You know, they have those around San Diego. I'll take my TRX there and do a little workout when my kids are playing in the grass. Or I'll take my TRX to the playground and hook it up to the swing set or hook it up to a uh, basketball pole that's not being used. So you have different options. But you have to know what to do in the first place. That's what I'm trying to do through the podcast. I'm trying to introduce you to different people, different ideas, different resources that you can use to be more active in your life. 
you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. And I try to have the guests on to try to engage people. You know, Sean does have some relationship with TRX. I'm going to have a link down to TRX below in the show notes so you can do that. Because, hey, look, if nothing else, you know, if you buy a TRX, and, and they're not inexpensive. I mean, they're a couple hundred dollars. But there's a ton of resources for how to use a TRX on your own. You can use a TRX at home. You can use a TRX in the park. You can use a TRX with your kids. You know, and that, that's what I, that's, you know, kind of my hope, my goal is to try to help you be more creative. So yeah, you can go to a gym and, you know, throw your kids in daycare. And I'm definitely guilty of that. I definitely do that quite a bit. But you can also look at ways to engage your kids. How can you be more active with them? You know, we're trying to get out and do more hikes with our kids. We're trying to get out, you know, when I go to the playground now, I try to, you know, do exercise with them and have them join me. So we model, they're getting a little bit older. I try to model that behavior so they learn by seeing and learn by doing. But to bring it back to Sean and bring it back to the conversation, I wanted to have her on because she is an influential person on Instagram. She is one that she has been recognized by a couple different magazines as being an influential trainer on Instagram. And she also has an education background. That's why I think it's so unique. Actually, when we, when we got, off, uh, got off the conversation, we got finished with the conversation, I put her in touch with a couple of colleagues at the American Council on Exercise because I think she'd be a good resource for them. You know, she's learning how to use this new medium to engage people. And I think that's very powerful because you might see a post that she's done and you might be more encouraged to go out and be more active yourself. And isn't that what it's all about? Thanks for tuning in to this episode of All About Fitness. If you have any questions, any comments, you can reach me, Pete, at PeteMcCallFitness.com. My Instagram handle is PeteMcCall underscore fitness. On Instagram is at PeteMcCall underscore fitness. I've been trying to be more active on that lately, posting up workouts and other ideas. On Twitter, I tweet out my blogs. My Twitter handle is PeteMC underscore fitness. That's PeteMC underscore fitness on Twitter. But keep up. I got some, you keep touching back with the All About Fitness. I'm really excited. I've had some fascinating conversations lately. I got some great interviews coming up. And if you have any ideas for guests that you think I should have on here, by all means, reach out to me, Twitter, email, whatever. Reach out to me and make that suggestion because I want to make this a platform where we can all learn from one another about how we can be more active in our lives. So again, my email is Pete at PeteMcCallFitness.com. Thanks for stopping by, and I look forward to having you join me for future episodes.